Victorian short stories of troubled marriages. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Irremediable by Ella Darcy. Monochromes, London. John Lane, 1893. A young man strolled along a country road one August evening after a long, delicious day. A day of that blessed idleness the man of leisure never knows. One must be a bank clerk 49 weeks out of the 52 before one can really appreciate the exquisite enjoyment of doing nothing for 12 hours at a stretch. Willoughby had spent the morning lounging about a sunny rickyard. Then, when the heat grew unbearable, he had retreated to an orchard, where, lying on his back in the long, cool grass, he had traced the pattern of the apple leaves diapered above him upon the summer sky. Now that the heat of the day was over, he had come to Rome with a sweet fancy led him, to lean over gates, view the prospect, and meditate upon the pleasures of a well-spent day. Five such days had already passed over his head. Fifteen more remained to him. Then farewell to freedom and clean country air, back again to London, and another year's toil. He came to a gate on the right of the road. Behind it, a footpath meandered up over a grassy slope. The sheep nibbling on its summit cast long shadows down the hill almost to his feet. Road and field path were equally new to him, but the latter offered greener attractions. He vaulted lightly over the gate and had so little idea he was taking thus the first step towards ruin that he began to whistle white wings from pure joy of life. The sheep stopped feeding and raised their heads to stare at him from pale-lashed eyes. First one and then another broke into a startled run until there was a sudden woolly stampede of the entire flock. When Willoughby gained the ridge from which they had just scattered, he came in sight of a woman sitting on a stile at the further end of the field. As he advanced towards her, he saw that she was young, and that she was not what is called a lady, of which he was glad. An earlier episode in his career, having indissolubly associated in his mind ideas of feminine refinement with those of feminine treachery. He thought it probable this girl would be willing to dispense with the formalities of an introduction, and that he might venture with her on some pleasant, foolish chat. As she made no movement to let him pass, he stood still, and looking at her, began to smile. She returned his gaze from unabashed dark eyes, and then laughed, showing teeth white, sound and smooth as split hazelnuts. "'Do you want to get over?' she remarked familiarly. "'I'm afraid I can't without disturbing you.' "'Don't you think you're much better where you are?' said the girl, on which Willoughby hazarded. "'You mean to say looking at you? Well, perhaps I am.' The girl at this laughed again, but nevertheless dropped herself down into the further field. Then, leaning her arms upon the crossbar, she informed the young man, "'Nah, I don't want to spoil your walk.' You were going perhaps to Beacon Point? It's very pretty that way. I was going nowhere in particular, he replied, just exploring, so to speak. I'm a stranger in these parts. How funny. I'm a stranger here too. I only come down last week, last Friday, to star with Nart of mine in Horton. Are you starting in Horton? Willoughby told her he was not in Horton, but at Povey Cross Farm, out in the other direction. "'Ah, Mrs. Payne's, ain't it? "'I've heard aunt speak of her. "'She takes summer boarders, don't she? "'I expect you come from London, eh?' "'And I expect you come from London too,' said Willoughby, "'recognising the familiar accent. "'You're as sharp as a needle,' cried the girl, "'with her unrestrained laugh. "'So I do. I'm here for a holiday, "'cause I was so done up with the work and the hot weather. "'I don't look as though I'd been ill, do I? "'But I was, though.' for it was just stifling hot up in our workrooms all last month, and tailoring's awful hard at the best of times. Willoughby felt a sudden accession of interest in her. Like many intelligent young men, he had dabbled a little in socialism, and at one time had wandered among the dispossessed. But since then, 
had caught up and held loosely the new doctrine. It is a good and fitting thing that woman also should earn her bread by the sweat of her brow. Always in reference to the woman who, fifteen months before, had treated him ill, he had said to himself that even the breaking of stones in the road should be considered a more feminine employment than the breaking of hearts. He gave way, therefore, to a movement of friendliness for this working daughter of the people, and joined her on the other side of the stile, in token of his approval. She, twisting round to face him, leaned now with her back against the bar, and the sunset fires lent a fleeting glory to her face. Perhaps she guessed how becoming the light was, for she took off her hat, and let it touch to gold the ends and fringes of her rough, abundant hair. Thus, and at this moment, she made an agreeable picture, to which stood as background all the beautiful, wooded, Southshire view. "'You don't really mean to say you're a tailoress,' said Willoughby, with a sort of eager compassion. "'I do, though, and I've been one ever since I was fourteen. Look at my fingers, if you don't believe me.' She put out her right hand, and he took hold of it, as he was expected to do. The finger-ends were frayed and blackened by needle-pricks, but the hand itself was plump, moist, and not unshapely. She, meanwhile, examined Willersby's fingers, enclosing hers. "'It's easy to see you've never done no work,' she said, half admiring, half envious. "'I suppose you're a tip-top swell, ain't ya?' "'Oh, yes. I'm a tremendous swell indeed,' said Willoughby, ironically. He thought of his hundred and thirty pounds salary and he mentioned his position in the British and Colonial Banking House, without shedding much illumination on her mind, for she insisted, "'Well, anyhow, you're a gentleman. I often wished I was a lady. It must be so nice to wear fine clothes, and never have to do any work all day long.' Willoughby thought it innocent of the girl to say this. It reminded him of his own notion as a child, that kings and queens put on their crowns the first thing on rising in the morning, his cordiality rose another degree. "'If being a gentleman means having nothing to do,' said he, smiling, "'I can certainly lay no claim to that title. "'Life isn't all beer and skittles with me, "'any more than it is with you, "'which is the better reason for enjoying the present moment, don't you think? "'Suppose now, like a kind little girl, "'you were to show me the way to Beacon Point, "'which you say is so pretty.' "'She required no further persuasion.' As he walked beside her, through the upland fields where the dusk was beginning to fall, and the white evening moths to emerge from their daytime hiding-places, she asked him many personal questions, most of which he thought fit to parry. Taking no offence thereat, she told him instead much concerning herself and her family. Thus he learned her name was Esther Stables, that she and her people lived Whitechapel Way, that her father was seldom sober, and that her mother always ill, and that the aunt with whom she was staying kept the post office and general shop in Orton Village. He learned, too, that Esther was discontented with life in general, that, though she hated being at home, she found the country dreadfully dull, and that consequently she was extremely glad to have made his acquaintance. But what he chiefly realised when they parted was that he had spent a couple of pleasant hours talking nonsense with a girl who was natural, simple-minded, and entirely free from that repellently protective atmosphere with which a woman of the classes so carefully surrounds herself. He and Esther had made friends with the ease and rapidity of children before they have learned the dreaded meaning of etiquette. And they said good night, not without some talk of meeting each other again. Obliged to breakfast at a quarter to eight in town, Willoughby was always luxuriously late when in the country, where he took his meals also in leisurely fashion, often reading from a book propped up on the table before him. But the morning after his meeting with Esther Stables found him less disposed to read than usual. Her image obtruded itself upon the printed page, and at length grew so importunate he came to the conclusion the only way to lay it was the girl herself. Wanting some tobacco, he saw a good reason for going into Orton. 
Esther had told him he could get tobacco and everything else at her aunt's. He found the post office to be one of the first houses in the widely spaced village street. In front of the cottage was a small garden ablaze with old-fashioned flowers, and in a large garden at one side were apple trees, raspberry and currant bushes, and six thatched beehives on a bench. The bowed windows of the little shop were partly screened by sun blinds, Nevertheless, the lower pane still displayed a heterogeneous collection of goods. Lemons, hanks of yarn, white linen buttons upon blue cards, sugar cones, church warden pipes and tobacco jars. A letterbox opened its narrow mouth low down in one wall and over the door swung the sign, Stamps and Money Order Office, in black letters on white enamelled iron. The interior of the shop was cool and dark. A second glass door at the back permitted Willoughby to see into a small sitting room and out again through a low and square-paned window to the sunny landscape beyond. Silhouetted against the light were the heads of two women, the rough young head of yesterday's Esther, the lean outline and bugled cap of Esther's aunt. It was the latter who at the jingling of the doorbell rose from her work and came forward to serve the customer. But the girl with much mute meaning in her eyes and a finger laid upon her smiling mouth followed behind. Her aunt heard her footfall. "'What do you want here, Esther?' she said with thin disapproval. "'Get back to your sewing!' Esther gave the young man a signal seen only by him and slipped out into the side garden where he found her when his purchases were made. She leaned over the privet hedge to intercept him as he passed. Aunt's an awful old maid, she remarked apologetically. I believe she'd never let me say a word to anyone if she could help it. So you got home all right last night? Willoughby inquired. What did your aunt say to you? Ah, oh, she asked where I'd been, and I told her a lot of lies. Then, with a woman's intuition... Perceiving that this speech jarred, Esther made haste to add, She's so dreadful hard on me. I doesn't tell her that I've been with a gentleman, or she'd never let me out alone again. And at present, I suppose you'll be found somewhere about that same style every evening, said Willoughby foolishly, for he really did not much care whether he met her again or not. Now he was actually in her company. He was surprised at himself for having given her a whole morning's thought. Yet the eagerness of her answer flattered him too. Tonight I can't come, worse luck. It's Thursday, and the shops here close of a Thursday at five. I have to keep Aunt company. But tomorrow? I can be there tomorrow. You'll come, say? Esther! cried a vexed voice, and the precise right minded aunt emerged through a row of raspberry bushes. Whatever are you thinking about? Delaying the gentleman in this fashion? She was full of rustic and official civility for the gentleman, but indignant with her niece. I don't want none of your London manners down here, Willoughby heard her say as she marched the girl off. He himself was not sorry to be released from Esther's too friendly eyes, and he spent an agreeable evening over a book, and this time managed to forget her completely. Though he remembered her first thing next morning, it was to smile wisely and determine he would not meet her again. Yet, by dinner time, the day seemed long. Why, after all, should he not meet her? By tea time, Prudence triumphed anew. No, he would not go. Then he drank his tea hastily and set off for the stile. Esther was waiting for him. Expectation had given an additional colour to her cheeks, and her red-brown hair showed here and there a beautiful glint of gold. He could not help admiring the vigorous way in which it waved and twisted, or the little curls which grew at the nape of her neck, tight and close as those of a young lamb's fleece. Her neck here was admirable too, in its smooth creaminess, and when her eyes lighted up with such evident pleasure at his coming, how avoid the conviction that she was a good and nice girl after all? He proposed they should go down into the little copse on the right, where they would be less disturbed by the occasional passer-by. Here, 
Seated on a felled tree trunk, Willoughby began that bantering, silly, meaningless form of conversation known among the classes as flirting. He had but the wish to make himself agreeable and to while away the time. Esther, however, misunderstood him. Willoughby's hand lay palm downwards on his knee, and she, noticing a ring which he wore on his little finger, took hold of it. What a funny ring, she said. Let's look. To disembarrass himself of her touch, he pulled the ring off and gave it to her to examine. What's that ugly dark green stone, she asked. It's called a sardonyx. What's it for, she said, turning it about. It's a signet ring, to seal letters with. And there's a sort of king's head scratched on it, and some writing too, only I can't make it out. It isn't the head of a king, although it wears a crown, will it be explained, but the head and bust of a Saracen, against whom my ancestor of many hundred years ago went to fight in the Holy Land, and the words cut round it are our motto, Virtue Vonce, which means Virtue Prevails. Willoughby may have displayed some accession of dignity in giving this bit of family history, for Esther fell into uncontrolled laughter, at which he was much displeased. And when the girl made as though she would put the ring on her own finger, asking, Shall I keep it? He coloured up with sudden annoyance. He was only my fan, said Esther hastily, and gave him the ring back, but his cordiality was gone. He felt no inclination to renew the idle word pastime, said it was time to go, and swinging his cane vexedly, struck off the heads of the flowers and the weeds as he went. Esther walked by his side in complete silence, a phenomenon of which he presently became conscious. He felt rather ashamed of having shown temper. "'Well, here's your way home,' said he, with an effort at friendliness. "'Good-bye. We've had a nice evening, anyhow.' It was pleasant down there in the woods, eh? He was astonished to see her eyes soften with tears, and to hear the real emotion in her voice as she answered, It was just heaven, down there with you, until you turned so funny-like. What had I done to make you cross? Say you forgive me, do. Silly child, said Willoughby, completely mollified. I'm not the least angry. There, good-bye. And like a fool, he kissed her. He anathematized his folly in the white light of next morning, and remembering the kiss he had given her, repented it very sincerely. He had an uncomfortable suspicion she had not received it in the same spirit in which it had been bestowed, but attaching more serious meaning to it would build expectations thereon which must be left unfulfilled. It was best indeed not to meet her again, for he acknowledged to himself that, though he only half liked, and even slightly feared her, there was a certain attraction about her. Was it in her dark, unflinching eyes, or in her very red lips, which might lead him into greater follies still? Thus it came about, that for two successive evenings Esther waited for him in vain, and on the third evening he said to himself with a grudging relief, that by this time she had probably transferred her affections to someone else. It was Saturday, the second Saturday since he left town. He spent the day about the farm, contemplated the pigs, inspected the feeding of the stock, and assisted at the afternoon milking. Then, at evening, with a refilled pipe, he went for a long lean over the west gate, while he traced fantastic pictures and wove romances in the glories of the sunset clouds. He watched the colours glow from gold to scarlet, change to crimson, sink at last to a sad purple, reefs and isles, when the sudden consciousness of someone being near him made him turn around. There stood Esther, and her eyes were full of eagerness and anger. "'Why have you never been to the stile again?' she asked him. "'You promised to come faithful, and you never came.' "'Why have you not kept your promise? Why? Why?' she persisted, stamping her foot because Willoughby remained silent. What could he say? Tell her she had no business to follow him like this? Or own what was, unfortunately, the truth? 
He was just a little glad to see her. Perhaps you don't care for me any more, she said. Well, why did you kiss me then? Why indeed, thought Willoughby, marvelling at his own idiocy. And yet such is the inconsistency of man, not wholly without the desire to kiss her again. And while he looked at her, she suddenly flung herself down on the hedge-bank at his feet and burst into tears. She did not cover up her face, but simply pressed one cheek down upon the grass, while the water poured from her eyes with astonishing abundance. Willoughby saw the dry earth turn dark and moist as it drank the tears in. This, his first experience of Esther's powers of weeping, distressed him horribly. Never in his life before had he seen anyone weep like that. He should not have believed such a thing possible. He was alarmed, too, lest she should be noticed from the house. He opened the gate. Esther, he begged, don't cry. Come out here like a dear girl and let us talk sensibly. Because she stumbled, unable to see her way through wet eyes, he gave her his hand, and they found themselves in a field of corn, walking along the narrow grass path that skirted it, in the shadow of the hedgerow. "'What is there to cry about, because you've not seen me for two days?' he began. "'Why, Esther, we're only strangers, after all. "'When we've been at home a week or two, we shall scarcely remember each other's names.' Esther sobbed at intervals, but her tears had ceased. "'It's fine for you to talk of home,' she said to this. "'You've got something that is home, I suppose. "'But me, my home's like hell, "'with nothing but quarrelling and cursing "'and a father who beats us, whether sober or drunk. "'Yes,' she repeated shrewdly, "'seeing the lively disgust on Willoughby's face. "'He beat me, all ill as I was, "'just before I come away. "'I could show you the bruises on my arms still, "'and now to go back there after knowing you. "'It'll be worse than ever.' I can't endure it, and I won't. I'll put an end to it, or myself somehow, I swear. But my poor Esther, how can I help it? What can I do? said Willoughby. He was greatly moved, full of wrath with her father, with all the world which makes women suffer. He had suffered himself at the hands of a woman, and severely, but this, instead of hardening his heart, had only rendered it the more supple and yet he had a vivid perception of the peril in which he stood. An interior voice urged him to break away, to seek safety in flight even at the cost of appearing cruel or ridiculous. So, coming to a point in the field where an elm hole jutted out across the path, he saw with relief he could now withdraw his hand from the girls, since they must walk singly to skirt round it. Esther took a step in advance, stopped, and suddenly turned to face him. She held out her two hands, and her face was very near his own. "'Don't you care for me one little bit?' she said wistfully. And surely sudden madness fell upon him, for he kissed her again. He kissed her many times. He took her in his arms and pushed all thoughts of the consequences far from him. But when, an hour later, he and Esther stood by the last gate on the road to Wharton, some of these consequences were already calling loudly to him. "'You know I have only one hundred and thirty pounds a year,' he told her. "'It's no very brilliant prospect for you to marry me on that.' For he had actually offered her marriage, although to the mediocre man such a proceeding must appear incredible, uncalled for, but to Willoughby overwhelmed with sadness and remorse, it seemed the only atonement possible. Sudden exultation leaped at Esther's heart. Oh, I'm used to managing, she told him, confidently, and mentally resolved to buy herself, so soon as she was married, a black feather boa, such as she had coveted last winter. Willoughby spent the remaining days of his holiday in thinking out and planning with Esther the details of his return to London and her own, the secrecy to be observed, the necessary legal steps to be taken, and the quiet suburb in which they would set up housekeeping. And so successfully did he carry out his arrangements, that within five weeks from the day on which he had first met Esther Stables, he and she came out one morning from a church in Highbury, husband and wife. It was a mellow September day. The streets were filled with sunshine, 
and Willoughby, in reckless high spirits, imagined he saw a reflection of his own gaiety on the indifferent faces of the passers-by. There being no one else to perform the office, he congratulated himself very warmly, and Esther's frequent laughter filled in the pauses of the day. Three months later, Willoughby was dining with a friend, and the hour hand of the clock nearing ten, the host no longer resisted the guest's growing anxiety to be gone. He arose and exchanged with him good wishes and good-byes. "'Marriage is evidently a most successful institution,' said he, half jesting, half sincere. "'You almost make me inclined to go and get married myself. Confess now your thoughts have been at home the whole evening.' Willoughby, thus addressed, turned red to the roots of his hair, but did not deny it. The other laughed. "'I'm very commendable they should be,' he continued, "'since you're scarcely so to speak out of your honeymoon.' With a social smile on his lips, Willoughby calculated a moment before replying, "'I have been married exactly three months and three days.' Then, after a few words respecting their next meeting, the two shook hands and parted, the young host to finish the evening with books and pipe, the young husband to set out on a twenty minutes' walk to his home. It was a cold, clear December night, following a day of rain. A touch of frost in the air had dried the pavements, and Willoughby's footfall ringing upon the stones re-echoed down the empty suburban street. Above his head was a dark, remote sky, thickly powdered with stars, and as he turned westwards, Alpharat hung for a moment, comme le point sur un i, over the slender spire of St. John's. But he was insensible to the worlds about him. He was absorbed in his own thoughts, and these, as his friend had surmised, were entirely with his wife. For Esther's face was always before his eyes, her voice was always in his ears. She filled the universe for him. Yet only four months ago he had never seen her, had never heard her name. This was the curious part of it. Here in December he found himself the husband of a girl who was completely dependent on him, not only for food, clothes and lodging, but for her present happiness, her whole future life. And last July he had been scarcely more than a boy himself, with no greater care on his mind than the pleasant difficulty of deciding where he should spend his annual three weeks' holiday. But it is events, not months or years, which age. Willoughby, who was only twenty-six, remembered his youth as a sometime companion irrevocably lost to him. Its vague, delightful hopes were now crystallised into definite ties and its happy irresponsibilities displaced by a sense of care, inseparable perhaps from the most fortunate of marriages. As he reached the street in which he lodged, his pace involuntarily slackened, while some distance off, his eye sought out and distinguished the windows of the room in which Esther awaited him. Through the broken slats of the Venetian blinds, he could see the yellow gaslight within. The parlour beneath was in darkness. His landlady had evidently gone to bed, there being no light over the hall door either. In some apprehension, he consulted his watch under the last street lamp he passed, to find comfort in assuring himself it was only ten minutes after ten. He let himself in with his latch-key, hung up his hat and overcoat by the sense of touch, and groping his way upstairs, opened the door of the first-floor sitting-room. At the table, in the centre of the room, sat his wife, leaning upon her elbows, her two hands thrust up into her ruffled hair. Spread out before her was a crumpled yesterday's newspaper, and so interested was she to all appearance in its contents that she neither spoke nor looked up as Willoughby entered. Around her were the still unclear tokens of her last meal, tea stops, breadcrumbs, and an eggshell crushed to fragments upon a plate, which was one of those trifles that set Willoughby's teeth on edge. Whenever his wife ate an egg, 
she persisted in turning the egg cup upside down upon the tablecloth and pounding the shell to pieces in her plate with her spoon. The room was repulsive in its disorder. The one lighted burner of the gasolier, turned too high, hissed up into a long tongue of flame. The fire smoked feebly under a newly administered shovelful of slack, and a heap of ashes and cinders littered the grate. A pair of walking boots, caked in dry mud, lay on the hearth rug just where they had been thrown off. On the mantelpiece, amidst a dozen other articles, which had no business there, was a bedroom candlestick, and every single article of furniture stood crookedly out of its place. Willoughby took in the whole intolerable picture, and yet spoke with kindliness. "'Well, Esther, I'm not so late after all. I hope you did not find the time dull by yourself.' Then he explained the reason of his absence. He had met a friend he had not seen for a couple of years, who had insisted on taking him home to dine. His wife gave no sign of having heard him. She kept her eyes riveted on the paper before her. "'You received my wire, of course,' Willoughby went on, "'and did not wait?' Now she crushed the newspaper up with a passionate movement and threw it from her. She raised her head, showing cheeks blazing with anger and dark, sullen, unflinching eyes. "'I did wait then,' she cried. "'I waited till near eight before I got your old telegraph. "'I suppose that's what you call the manners of a gentleman, "'to keep your wife mewed up here while you go gallivanting off with your fine friends.' Whenever Esther was angry, which was often... She taunted Willoughby with being a gentleman, although this was the precise point about him, which at other times found most favour in her eyes. But tonight she was envenomed by the idea that he had been enjoying himself without her, stung by fear lest he should have been in company with some other woman. Willoughby, hearing the taunt, resigned himself to the inevitable. Nothing that he could do might now avert the breaking storm. All his words would only be twisted into fresh griefs, but sad experience had taught him that to take refuge in silence was more fatal still. When Esther was in such a mood as this, it was best to supply the fire with fuel, that, through the very violence of the conflagration, it might the sooner burn itself out. So he said what soothing things he could, and Esther caught them up, disfigured them, and flung them back at him with scorn. She reproached him with no longer caring for her. She vituperated the conduct of his family in never taking the smallest notice of her marriage, and she detailed the insolence of the landlady, who had told her that morning she pitied poor Mr. Willoughby, and had refused to go out and buy herrings for Esther's early dinner. Every affront or grievance, real or imaginary since the day she and Willoughby had first met, she poured forth with a fluency due to frequent repetition, for, with the exception of today's added injuries, Willoughby had heard the whole litany many times before. While she raged, and he looked at her, he remembered he had once thought her pretty. He had seen beauty in her rough brown hair, her strong colouring, her full red mouth. He fell into musing, a woman may lack beauty, he told himself, and yet be loved. Meanwhile, Esther reached white heats of passion, and the strain could no longer be sustained. She broke into sobs, and began to shed tears with the facility peculiar to her. In a moment her face was all wet with the big drops which rolled down her cheeks faster and faster, and fell with audible splashes onto the table, onto her lap, on to the floor. To this tearful abundance, formerly a surprising spectacle, Willoughby was now acclimatised. But the remnant of chivalrous feeling had not yet extinguished in his bosom, forbade him to sit stolidly by while a woman wept, without seeking to console her. As on previous occasions, his peace overtures were eventually accepted. Esther's tears gradually ceased to flow, she began to exhibit a sort of compunction. She wished to be forgiven, and with the kiss of reconciliation, passed into a phase 
of demonstrative affection, perhaps more trying to Willoughby's patience than all that had preceded it. "'You don't love me?' she questioned. "'I'm sure you don't love me,' she reiterated. And he asseverated that he loved her until he despised himself. Then at last, only half satisfied but wearied out with vexation, possibly too with a movement of pity at the sight of his haggard face, she consented to leave him. Only what was he going to do? she asked suspiciously. Write those rubbishing stories of his. Well, he must promise not to stay up more than half an hour at the latest, only until he had smoked one pipe. Willoughby promised, as he would have promised anything on earth to secure himself a half-hour's peace and solitude. Esther groped for her slippers, which were kicked off under the table, scratched four or five matches along the box, and threw them away before she succeeded in lighting her candle, set it down again to contemplate her tear-swollen reflection in the chimney-glass, and burst out laughing. "'What a fright I do look, to be sure!' she remarked complacently, and again thrust her two hands up through her disordered curls. Then, holding the candle at such an angle that the grease ran over the carpet, she gave Willoughby another vehement kiss, and trailed out of the room with an ineffectual attempt to close the door behind her. Willoughby got up to shut it himself, and wondered why it was that Esther never did any one mortal thing efficiently or well. Good God, how irritable he felt! It was impossible to write. He must find an outlet for his impatience, rend or mend something. He began to straighten the room, but a wave of disgust came over him before the task was fairly commenced. What was the use? Tomorrow all would be bad as before. What was the use of doing anything? He sat down by the table and leaned his head upon his hands. The past came back to him in pictures. His boyhood's past, first of all. He saw again the old home, every inch of which was familiar to him as his own name. He reconstructed in his thought all the old, well-known furniture and replaced it precisely as it had stood long ago. He passed again a childish finger over the rough surface of the faded Utrecht velvet chairs and smelled again the strong fragrance of the white lilac tree blowing in through the open parlour window. He savoured anew the pleasant mental atmosphere produced by the dainty neatness of cultured women, the companionship of a few good pictures, of a few good books. Yet this home had been broken up years ago. The dear familiar things had been scattered far and wide, never to find themselves under the same roof again. And from those near relatives who still remained to him, he lived now hopelessly estranged. Then came the past of his first love dream, when he worshipped at the feet of Nora Beresford, and with the whole-heartedness of the true fanatic, clothed his idol with every imaginable attribute of virtue and tenderness. To this day there remained a secret shrine in his heart, wherein the lady of his young ideal was still enthroned, although it was long since he had come to perceive she had nothing whatever in common with the Nora of reality. For the real Nora he had no longer any sentiment. She had passed altogether out of his life and thoughts. And yet so permanent is all influence, whether good or evil, that the effect she wrought upon his character remained. He recognised tonight that her treatment of him in the past did not count for nothing among the various factors which had determined his fate. Now the past of only last year returned, and strangely enough, this seemed farther removed from him than all the rest. He had been particularly strong, well, and happy this time last year. Nora was dismissed from his mind, and he had thrown all his energies into his work. His tastes were sane and simple, and his dingy furnished rooms had become through habit very pleasant to him. In being his own, they were invested with a greater charm than another man's castle, here he had smoked and studied, 
Here he had made many a glorious voyage into the land of books. Many a homecoming, too, rose up before him out of the dark, ungenial streets, to a clear, blazing fire, a neatly laid cloth, an evening of ideal enjoyment. Many a summer twilight, when he mused at the open window, plunging his gaze deep into the recesses of his neighbour's lime tree, where the unseen sparrows chattered with such unflagging gaiety. He had always been given to much daydreaming, and it was in the silence of his rooms of an evening that he had turned his phantasmal adventures into stories for the magazines. Here had come to him many an editorial refusal, but here, too, he had received the news of his first unexpected success. All his happiest memories were embalmed in those shabby, badly furnished rooms. Now all was changed. Now might there be no longer any soft indulgence of the hour's mood. His rooms and everything he owned belonged now to Esther, too. She had objected to most of his photographs and had removed them. She hated books, and were he ever so ill-advised as to open one in her presence, she immediately began to talk, no matter how silent or how sullen her previous mood had been. If he read aloud to her, she either yawned despairingly, or was tickled into laughter where there was no reasonable cause. At first, Willoughby had tried to educate her, and had gone hopefully to the task. It is so natural to think you may make what you will of the woman who loves you. But Esther had no wish to improve. She evinced all the self-satisfaction of an illiterate mind. To her husband's gentle admonitions, she replied with brevity that she thought her way quite as good as his, or if he didn't approve of her pronunciation, he might do the other thing. She was too old to go to school again. He gave up the attempt, and with humiliation at his previous futurity, perceived that it was folly to expect that a few weeks of his companionship could alter or pull up the impressions of years, or rather, of generations. Yet here he paused to admit a curious thing, it was not only Esther's bad habits which vexed him, but habits quite unblameworthy in themselves which he never would have noticed in another irritated him in her. He disliked her manner of standing, of walking, of sitting in a chair, of folding her hands. Like a lover, he was conscious of her proximity without seeing her. Like a lover, too, his eyes followed her every movement, his ear noted every change in her voice. But then, instead of being charmed by everything as the lover is, everything jarred upon him. What was the meaning of this? Tonight the anomaly pressed upon him. He reviewed his position. Here was he, quite a young man, just twenty-six years of age, married to Esther, and bound to live with her so long as life should last, Twenty, forty, perhaps fifty years more. Every day of those years to be spent in her society, he and she, face to face, soul to soul, they two alone amid all the whirling, busy, indifferent world. So near together in semblance, in truth, so far apart as regards all that makes life dear. Willoughby groaned. From the woman he did not love, whom he had never loved, he might not again go free, so much he recognised. The feeling he had once entertained for Esther, strange compound of mistaken chivalry and flattered vanity, was long since extinct. But what, then, was the sentiment with which she inspired him? For he was not indifferent to her, no, Never for one instant could he persuade himself he was indifferent. Never for one instant could he banish her from his thoughts. His mind's eye followed her during his hours of absence, as pertinaciously as his bodily eye dwelt upon her actual presence. She was the principal object of the universe to him, the centre around which his wheel of life revolved with an appalling fidelity. What did it mean? What could it mean, he asked himself with anguish. 
and the sweat broke out upon his forehead, and his hands grew cold. For on a sudden the truth lay there like a written word upon the tablecloth before him. This woman, whom he had taken to himself for better, for worse, inspired him with a passion, intense indeed, all masterful, soul-subduing as love itself. But when he understood the terror of his hatred, he laid his head upon his arms and wept, not facile tears like Esther's, but tears wrung out from his agonising, unavailing regret. End of Irremediable Victorian short stories of troubled marriages. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Poor Stick by Arthur Morrison Tales of Mean Streets, London, Methuen & Co. 1894 Published by permission of Methuen & Co. Mrs. Jennings, or Jinnins, as neighbours would have it, ruled absolutely at home, when she took so much trouble as to do anything at all there, which was less often than might have been. As for Robert, her husband, he was a poor stick, said the neighbours, and yet he was a man with enough of hardihood to remain a non-unionist in the erector shop at Maidment's all the years of his service. No mean test of a man's fortitude and resolution, as many a sufferer for independent opinion might testify. The truth was that Bob never grew out of his courtship blindness. Mrs. Jennings governed as she pleased, stayed out or came home as she chose, and cooked a dinner or didn't, as her inclination stood. Thus it was for ten years, during which time there were no children, and Bob bore all things uncomplaining, cooking his own dinner when he found none cooked, and sewing on his own buttons. Then of a sudden came children, till in three years there were three, and Bob Jennings had to nurse and to wash them as often as not. Mrs. Jennings at this time was what is called rather a fine woman, a woman of large scale and full development, whose slatternly habit left her coarse black hair to tumble in snake-locks about her face and shoulders half the day, who, clad in half-hooked clothes, bore herself notoriously and unabashed in her fullness, and of whom ill things were said regarding the lodger. The gossips had their excuse. The lodger was an irregular young cabinet-maker, who lost quarters and halves and whole days, who had been seen abroad with his landlady, what time Bob Jennings was put in the children to bed at home, who on his frequent holidays brought in much beer, which he and the woman shared, while Bob was at work. To carry the tale to Bob would have been a thankless errand, for he would have none of anybody's sympathy, even in regard to misery's plain to his eye. But the thing got about in the workshop, and there his days were made bitter. At home things grew worse. To return at half-past five and find the children still undressed, screaming, hungry and dirty, was a matter of habit. To get them food, to wash them, to tend the cuts and bumps sustained through the day of neglect, before lighting a fire and getting tea for himself, were matters of daily duty. Ah, he said to his sister, who came at intervals to say plain things about Mrs. Jennings, you shouldn't go for to set a man again his wife, Jen. Many are doing light work, I know, but there's natural to her. She ought to be married to a swell stead of me. She might have done easy if she liked, being such a fine girl. But she's good-hearted, is Melia, and she can't help being a bit thoughtless. Whereat his sister called him a fool. It was her customary good-bye at such times, and took herself off. Bob Jennings' intelligence was sufficient for his common needs, but it was never a vast intelligence. Now, under a daily burden of dull misery, it clouded and stooped. The base wit of the workshop he comprehended less, and realised more slowly than before. 
and the gaffer cursed him for a sleepy dolt. Mrs. Jennings ceased from any pretense of housewifery, and would sometimes sit, perchance not quite sober, while Bob washed the children in the evening, opening her mouth only to express her contempt for him and his establishment, and to make him understand that she was sick of both. Once, exasperated by his quietness, she struck at him, and for a moment he was another man. "'Don't do that, Millier!' he said, "'else I might forget myself!' His manner surprised his wife, and it was such that she never did do that again. So was Bob Jennings, without a friend in the world except his sister, who cheered him, and the children, who squalled at him. When his wife vanished with the lodger, the clock, a shade of wax flowers, Bob's best boots, which fitted the lodger, and his silver watch. Bob had returned as usual to the dirt and the children, and it was only when he struck a light that he found the clock was gone. "'Mummy took to clock said Minnie, the eldest child, who had followed him in from the door, and now gravely observed his movements. "'She took for tock, and went to ta and she took for flowers.' Bob lit the paraffin lamp with the green glass reservoir, and carried it and its evil smell about the house. Some things had been turned over, and others had gone, plainly. All Melier's clothes were gone. The lodger was not in, and under his bedroom window where his box had stood, there was naught but an oblong patch of conspicuously clean wallpaper. In a muddle of doubt and perplexity, Bob found himself at the front door, staring up and down the street. Diverse women neighbours stood at their doors and eyed him curiously, for Mrs. Webster, moralist, opposite, had not watched the day's proceedings, nor those of many other days, for nothing, nor had she kept her story to herself. He turned back into the house, a vague notion of what had befallen percolating feebly through his bewilderment. "'I don't know. I don't know,' he faltered, rubbing his ear. His mouth was dry, and he moved his lips uneasily as he gazed with aimless looks about the walls and ceiling. Presently his eyes rested on the child, and, Milly, he said decisively, "'Come and have your face washed.' He put the children to bed early and went out. In the morning, when his sister came, because she had heard the news in common with everybody else, he had not returned. Bob Jennings had never lost more than two quarters in his life, but he was not seen at the workshop all this day. His sister stayed in the house, and in the evening, at his regular homing time, he appeared, haggard and dusty, and began his preparations for washing the children. When he was made to understand that they had already been attended to, he looked doubtful and troubled for a moment. Presently he said, "'I ain't found her yet, Jin. I was in hopes she might have been back by this. I, I don't expect she'll be very long. She was always a bit larky, was Melier, but very good-hearted. His sister had prepared a strenuous lecture on the theme of I told you so, but the man was so broken, so meek, and so plainly unhinged in his faculties that she suppressed it. Instead, she gave him comfortable talk, and made him promise in the end to sleep that night, and take up his customary work in the morning. He did these things, and could have worked placidly enough had he but been alone. But the tale had reached the workshop, and there was no lack of brutish chafe to disorder him. This the decenter men would have no part in, and even protested against. But the ill-conditioned kept their way, till at the cry of, Bella! When all were starting for dinner, one of the worst shouted the cruelest jibe of all. Bob Jennings turned on him and knocked him over a scrap heap. A shout went up from the hurrying workmen with a chorus of, Save you right! And the fallen joker found himself awkwardly confronted by the shop bruiser. But Bob had turned to a corner and buried his eyes in the bend of his arm while his shoulders heaved and shook. He slunk away home and stayed there walking restlessly to and fro, and often peeping down the street from the window. When, at twilight, his sister came again, 
he had become almost cheerful and said with some briskness i'm a going to meet a gin at seven i know where she'll be waiting he went upstairs and after a little while came down again in his best black coat carefully smoothing a tall hat of obsolete shape with his pocket handkerchief i ain't wore it for years he said i ought to a wore it it, it might have pleased her she used to say she wouldn't walk with me in no other when i used to meet her in the evening at seven o'clock he brushed assiduously and put the hat on i'd better have a shave round the corner as i go along he added fingering his stubbly chin he received as one not comprehending his sister's persuasion to remain at home but when he went she followed at a little distance after his penny shave he made for the main road where company-keeping couples walked up and down all evening he stopped at a church and began pacing slowly to and fro before it eagerly looking out each way as he went his sister watched him for nearly half an hour and then went home in two hours more she came back with her husband bob was still there walking to and fro hello bob said his brother-in-law come along home and get to bed there's a good chap you'll be all right in the morning she ain't turned up bob complained or else i've missed her this is the regular place where i always used to meet her but she'll come to-morrow she used to leave me in the lurch sometimes being naturally larky but very good-hearted mind you very good-hearted she did not come the next evening nor the next nor the evening after nor the one after that but bob jennings howbeit depressed and anxious was always confident something's prevented her to-night he would say but she'll come to-morrow i'll buy a big blue tie to-morrow she used to like me in a blue tie i won't miss her to-morrow i'll come a little earlier so it went the black coat grew ragged in the service and hobbledehoys finding him safe sport smashed the tall hat over his eyes time after time he wept over the hat and straightened it as best he might was she coming night after night and night and night but tomorrow End of A Poor Stick by Arthur Morrison Victorian Short Stories of Troubled Marriages This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prize Lodger by George Gissing Human Odds and Ends, Stroke Stories and Sketches London, Lawrence and Bullen, Limited 1898 The ordinary West End Londoner, who is a citizen of no city at all, but dwells amid a mere conglomerate of houses at a certain distance from Charing Cross, has known a fleeting surprise when, by rare chance, his eye fell upon the name of some such newspaper as the Battersea Times, the Camberwell Mercury, or the Islington Gazette. To him, these and the like districts are nothing more than compass points of the huge metropolis. He may be, in practice, acquainted with them. If historically inclined, he may think of them as old-time villages swallowed up by the insatiable London, but he has never grasped the fact that in Battersea, Camberwell, Islington, there are people living who name these places as their home, who are born, subsist, and die there as though in a distinct town, and practically without consciousness of its obliteration in the map of a world capital. The stable element of this population consists of more or less old-fashioned people. Round about them is the ceaseless coming and going of nomads who keep abreast with the time, who take their lodgings by the week, their houses by the month, who camp indifferently in regions old and new, learning their geography in train and tramcar. Abiding parishioners are wont to be either very poor or established in a moderate prosperity. They lack enterprise either for good or ill. If comfortably off, they owe it, as a rule, to some predecessor's exertion. And for the most part, though little enough endowed with the civic spirit, 
they abundantly pride themselves on their local permanence. Representative of this class was Mr Archibald Jordan, a native of Islington, and at the age of five and forty still faithful to the streets which he had trodden as a child. His father started a small grocery business in Upper Street. Archibald succeeded to the shop, advanced soberly, and at length admitted a partner, by whose capital and energy the business was much increased. After his thirtieth year, Mr Jordan ceased to stand behind the counter. Of no very active disposition, and but moderately set on gain, he found it pleasant to spend a few hours daily over the books and the correspondence, and for the rest of his time to enjoy a gossipy leisure, straying among the acquaintances of a lifetime, or making new in the decorous bar parlours, billiard rooms, and other such retreats which allured his bachelor liberty. His dress and bearing were unpretentious, but impressively respectable. He never allowed his garments, made by an Islington tailor an old schoolfellow, to exhibit the least sign of wear, but fashion affected their style as little as possible. Of middle height, and tending to portliness, he walked at an unvarying pace, as a man who had never known undignified hurry. In his familiar thoroughfares he glanced about him with a good-humoured air of proprietorship, or with a look of thoughtful criticism for any changes that might be going forward. No one had ever spoken flatteringly of his visage. He knew himself a very homely-featured man, and accepted the fact as something that had neither favoured nor hindered him in life. But it was his conviction that no man's eye had a greater power of solemn and overwhelming rebuke, and this gift he took a pleasure in exercising, however trivial the occasion. For five and twenty years he had lived in lodgings, always within the narrow range of Islington respectability, yet never for more than a twelve months under the same roof. This peculiar feature of Mr. Jordan's life had made him a subject of continual interest to local landladies, among whom were several lifelong residents, on friendly terms of old time with the Jordan family. To them it seemed an astonishing thing that a man in such circumstances had not yet married. Granting this eccentricity, they could not imagine what made him change his abode so often. Not a landlady in Islington but would welcome Mr. Jordan in her rooms, and, having got him, do her utmost to prolong the connection. He had been known to quit a house on the paltriest excuse, removing to another in which he could not expect equally good treatment. There was no accounting for it. It must be taken as an ultimate mystery of life, and made the most of as a perennial topic of neighbourly conversation. As to the desirability of having Mr. Jordan for a lodger, there could be no difference of opinion among rational womankind. Mrs. Wiggins, indeed, had taken his sudden departure from her house so ill that she always spoke of him abusively. But who heeded Mrs. Wiggins? Even in the sadness of hope deferred, those ladies who had entertained him once, and speculated on his possible return, declared Mr. Jordan a thorough gentleman. Lodgers, as a class, do not recommend themselves in Islington. Mr. Jordan shone against the dusky background with almost dazzling splendour. To speak of lodgers as of cattle, he was a prize creature. A certain degree of comfort he firmly exacted. He might be a trifle fastidious about cooking. He stood upon his dignity, but no one could say that he grudged reward for service rendered. It was his practice to pay more than the landlady asked. Twenty-five shillings a week, you say? I shall give you twenty-eight, but and with raised forefinger he went through the catalogue of his demands. Everything must be done precisely as he directed. Even in the laying of his table he insisted upon certain minute peculiarities, and to forget one of them was to earn that gaze of awful reprimand which Mr. Jordan found, or thought, more efficacious than any spoken word. Against this precision might be set his strange indulgence in the matter of bills, he merely regarded the total, was never known to dispute an item. Only twice in his long experience had he quitted a lodging because of exorbitant charges, and on these occasions he sternly refused to discuss the matter. Mrs. Hawker, I am paying your account with the addition of one week's rent. Your rooms will be vacant at eleven o'clock tomorrow morning. 
and until the hour of departure no entreaty, no prostration could induce him to utter a syllable. It was on the 1st of June, 1889, his 45th birthday, that Mr. Jordan removed from quarters he had occupied for ten months and became a lodger in the house of Mrs. Elderfield. Mrs. Elderfield, a widow, aged three and thirty, with one little girl, was but a casual resident in Islington. She knew nothing of Mr. Jordan and made no inquiries about him. Strongly impressed, as every woman must needs be, by his air and tone of mild authority, she congratulated herself on the arrival of such an inmate, but no subservience appeared in her demeanour. She behaved with studious civility, nothing more. Her words were few and well chosen. Always neatly dressed, yet always busy, she moved about the house with quick, silent step, and cleanliness marked her path. The meals were well cooked well served. Mr. Jordan being her only lodger, she could devote to him an undivided attention. At the end of his first week, the critical gentleman felt greater satisfaction than he had ever known. The bill lay upon his table at breakfast time. He perused the items, and much against his habit, reflected upon them. Having breakfasted, he rang the bell. Mrs. Elderfield, he paused, and looked gravely at the widow. She had a plain, honest, healthy face, with resolute lips, and an eye that brightened when she spoke. Her well-knit figure, motionless in its respectful attitude, declared a thoroughly sound condition of the nerves. Mrs. Elderfield, your bill is so very moderate that I think you must have forgotten something. Have you looked it over, sir? I never trouble with the details. Please examine it. There's no need, sir. I never make a mistake. I said, Mrs. Elderfield, please examine it. She seemed to hesitate, but obeyed. The bill is quite correct, sir. Thank you. He paid it at once and said no more. The weeks went on. To Mr. Jordan's surprise, his landlady's zeal and efficiency showed no diminution a thing unprecedented in his long and varied experience. After the first day or two, he had found nothing to correct. Every smallest instruction was faithfully carried out. Moreover, he knew for the first time in his life the comfort of absolutely clean rooms. The best of his landladies hitherto had not risen above that conception of cleanliness which is relative to London soot and fog. His palate, too, was receiving an education. Probably he had never eaten of a joint rightly cooked, or tasted a potato boiled as it should be. More often than not, the food set before him had undergone a process which left it mysticable indeed, but void of savour and nourishment. Many little attentions of which he had never dreamed kept him in a wondering cheerfulness, and at length he said to himself, here I shall stay. Not that his constant removals had been solely due to discomfort and a hope of better things. The secret, perhaps not entirely revealed even to himself, lay in Mr. Jordan's sense of his own importance, and his uneasiness whenever he felt that, in the eyes of a landlady, he was becoming a mere everyday person, an ordinary lodger. No sooner did he detect a sign of this than he made up his mind to move. It gave him the keenest pleasure of which he was capable when, on abruptly announcing his immediate departure, he perceived the landlady's profound mortification. To make the blow heavier, he had even resorted to artifice, seeming to express a most lively contentment during the very days when he had decided to leave, and was asking himself where he should next abide. One of his delights was to return to a house which he had quitted years ago, to behold the excitement and bustle occasioned by his appearance, and play the good-natured autocrat over grovelling dependents. In every case, save the two already mentioned, he had parted with his landlady on terms of friendliness, never vouchsafing a reason for his going away, genially eluding every attempt to obtain an explanation, and at the last abounding in graceful recognition of all that had been done for him. Mr. Jordan shrank from dispute. 
hated every sort of contention. This characteristic gave a certain refinement to his otherwise commonplace existence. Vulgar vanity would have displayed itself in precisely the acts and words from which his self-esteem nervously shrank, and of late he had been thinking over the list of landladies with a half-formed desire to settle down, to make himself a permanent home. Doubtless, as a result of this state of mind, he betook himself to a strange house where, as from neutral ground, he might reflect upon the lodgings he knew and judge between their merits. He could not foresee what awaited him under Mrs. Elderfield's roof. The event impressed him as providential. He felt, with singular emotion, that choice was taken out of his hands. Lodgings could not be more than perfect, and such he had found. It was not his habit to chat with landladies. At times he held forth to them on some topic of interest, suavely, instructively, if he gave in to their ordinary talk, it was with a half-absent smile of condescension. Mrs. Elderfield, seeming as little disposed to gossip as himself, a month elapsed before he knew anything of her history. But one evening the reserve on both sides was broken. His landlady modestly inquired whether she was giving satisfaction, and Mr. Jordan replied with altogether unwanted fervour. In the dialogue that ensued, they exchanged personal confidences. The widow had lost her husband four years ago. She came from the Midlands, but had long dwelt in London. Then fell from her lips a casual remark which made the hearer uneasy. "'I don't think I shall always stay here. The neighbourhood is too crowded. I should like to have a house somewhere further out.' Mr. Jordan did not comment on this, but it kept a place in his daily thoughts, and became at length so much of an anxiety that he invited a renewal of the subject. "'You have no intention of moving just yet, Mrs. Elderfield?' "'I was going to tell you, sir,' replied the landlady, with her respectful calm, "'that I have decided to make a change next spring. Some friends of mine have gone to live at Wood Green, and I shall look for a house in the same neighbourhood. Mr. Jordan was, in private, gravely disturbed. He, who had flitted from house to house for many years, distressing the souls of landladies, now lamented the prospect of a forced removal. It was open to him to accompany Mrs. Elderfield, but he shrank from the thought of living in so remote a district. Wood Green, the very name, appalled him, for he had never been able to endure the country. He betook himself one dreary autumn afternoon to that northern suburb, and what he saw did not at all reassure him. On his way back he began once more to review the list of old lodgings. But from that day his conversations with Mrs. Elderfield grew more frequent, more intimate. In the evening he occasionally made an excuse for knocking at her parlour door, and lingered for a talk which ended only at supper-time. He spoke of his own affairs, and grew more ready to do so, as his hearer manifested a genuine interest, without impertinent curiosity. Little by little he imparted to Mrs. Elderfield a complete knowledge of his commercial history, of his pecuniary standing, matters of which he had never before spoken to a mere acquaintance. A change was coming over him. The foundations of habit crumbled beneath his feet. He lost his look of complacence, his self-confident and superior tone. Bar parlours and billiard-rooms saw him but rarely and flittingly. He seemed to have lost his pleasure in the streets of Islington, and spent all his spare time by the fireside, perpetually musing. On a day in March, one of his old landladies, Mrs. Higdon, sped to the house of another, Mrs. Evans, panting under a burden of strange news. Could it be believed? Mr. Jordan was going to marry, to marry that woman in whose house he was living? Mrs. Higdon had it on the very best authority, that of Mr. Jordan's partner, who spoke of the affair without reserve. A new house had already been taken. At Wood Green, well, after all these years, after so many excellent opportunities, to marry a mere stranger and forsake Islington. In a moment Mr. Jordan's character was gone. 
Had he figured in the police court under some disgraceful charge, these landladies could hardly have felt more shocked and professed themselves more disgusted. The intelligence spread. Women went out of their way to have a sight of Mrs. Elderfield's house. They hung about for a glimpse of that sinister person herself. She had robbed them, every one of a possible share in Islington's prize lodger. Had it been one of themselves, they could have borne the chagrin. But a woman whom not one of them knew, an alien, what base arts had she practised? Ah, it was better not to inquire too closely into the secrets of that lodging house. Though every effort was made to learn the time and the place of the ceremony, Mr. Jordan's landladies had the mortification to hear of his wedding only when it was over. Of course, this showed that he felt the disgracefulness of his behaviour. He was not utterly lost to shame. It could only be hoped that he would not know the bitterness of repentance. Not till he found himself actually living in the house at Wood Green did Mr. Jordan realise how little his own will had had to do with the recent course of events. Certainly he had made love to the widow, and had asked her to marry him, but from that point onward he seemed to have put himself entirely in Mrs. Elderfield's hands, granting every request, meeting halfway every suggestion she offered, becoming, in short, quite a different kind of man from his former self. He had not been sensible of a moment's reluctance. He enjoyed the novel sense of yielding himself to affectionate guidance. His wits had gone wool-gathering. They returned to him only after the short honeymoon at Brighton, when he stood upon his own hearth-rug and looked round at the new furniture and ornaments which symbolised a new beginning of life. The admirable landlady had shown herself energetic, clear-headed, and full of resource. It was she who chose the house, and transacted all the business in connection with it. Mr. Jordan had merely run about in her company from place to place, smiling approval and signing cheques. No one could have gone to work more prudently, or obtained what she wanted at smaller outlay. For all that, Mr. Jordan, having recovered something like his normal frame of mind, viewed the results with consternation. Left to himself, he would have taken a very small house, and furnished it much in the style of Islington lodgings. As it was, he occupied a ten-roomed villa, with appointments which seemed to him luxurious, aristocratic. True, the expenditure was of no moment to a man in his position, and there was no fear that Mrs. Jordan would involve him in dangerous extravagance, but he had always lived with such excessive economy that the sudden change to a life correspondent with his income could not but make him uncomfortable. Mrs. Jordan had, of course, seen to it that her personal appearance harmonised with the new surroundings. She dressed herself and her young daughter with careful appropriateness. There was no display, no purchase of gewgaws, merely garments of good quality such as become people in easy circumstances. She impressed upon her husband that this was nothing more than a return to the habits of her earlier life. Her first marriage had been a sad mistake. It had brought her down in the world. Now she felt restored to her natural position. After a week of restlessness, Mr. Jordan resumed his daily visits to the shop in Upper Street, where he sat, as usual, among the books and the correspondence, and tried to assure himself that all would henceforth be well with him. No more changing from house to house, a really comfortable home in which to spend the rest of his days, a kind and most capable wife to look after all his needs, to humour all his little habits, he could not have taken a wiser step. For all that, he had lost something, though he did not yet understand what it was. The first perception of a change not for the better flashed upon him one evening in the second week, when he came home an hour later than his wont. Mrs. Jordan, who always stood waiting for him at the window, had no smile as he entered. "'Why are you late?' she asked, in her clear, restrained voice. "'Oh, something or other kept me.' This would not do. Mrs. Jordan quietly insisted on a full explanation of the delay, and it seemed to her unsatisfactory. "'I hope you won't be irregular in your habits, Archibald,' said his wife, with gentle admonition. 
What I always liked in you is your methodical way of living. I should be very uncomfortable if I never know when to expect you. Yes, my dear, but business, you see. But you have explained that you could have been back at the usual time. Yes, that's true, but well, well, you won't let it happen again. Oh, really, Archibald, she suddenly exclaimed. The idea of you coming into the room with muddy boots. Why, look, there's a patch of mud on the carpet. It was my hurry to speak to you, murmured Mr. Jordan in confusion. Please go at once and take your boots off. And you left your slippers in the bedroom this morning. You must always bring them down and put them in the dining room cupboard. Then they're ready for you when you come into the house. Mr. Jordan had but a moderate appetite for his dinner, and he did not talk so pleasantly as usual. This was but the beginning of troubles such as he had not for a moment foreseen. His wife, having since their engagement taken the upper hand, began to show her determination to keep it, and day by day her rule grew more galling to the ex-bachelor. He himself in the old days had plagued his landladies by insisting upon method and routine, by his faddish attention to domestic minutiae. He now learnt what it was to be subjected to the same kind of despotism, exercised with much more exasperating persistence. Whereas Mrs. Elderfield had scrupulously obeyed every direction given by her lodger, Mrs. Jordan was evidently resolved that her husband should live, move, and have his being in the strictest accordance with her own ideal. Not in any spirit of nagging or ill-tempered unreasonableness, it was merely that she had her favourite way of doing every conceivable thing, and felt so sure that it was the best of all possible ways that she could not endure any other. The first serious disagreement between them had reference to conduct at the breakfast table. After a broken night feeling headachy and worried, Mr. Jordan took up his newspaper, folded it conveniently, and set it against the bread so that he could read while eating. Without a word, his wife gently removed it, and laid it aside on a chair. "'What are you doing?' he asked gruffly. "'You mustn't read at meals, Archibald. It's bad manners, and bad for your digestion. "'I've read the news at breakfast all my life, and I shall do so still,' exclaimed the husband, starting up and recovering his paper. "'Then you will have breakfast by yourself. Nelly, we must go into the other room till Papa has finished.' Miss Jordan ate mechanically, and stared at the newspaper with just as little consciousness. Prompted by the underlying weakness of his character to yield for the sake of peace, wrath made him dogged, and the more steadily he regarded his position, the more was he appalled by the outlook. Why, this meant downright slavery! He had married a woman so horribly like himself in several points that his only hope lay in overcoming her by sheer violence. A thoroughly good and well-meaning woman, an excellent housekeeper, the kind of wife to do him credit and improve his social position, but self-willed, pertinacious, and probably thinking herself his superior in every respect. He had nothing to fear but subjection, the one thing he had never anticipated, the one thing he could never endure. He went off to business without seeing his wife again and passed a lamentable day. At his ordinary hour of return, instead of setting off homeward, he strayed about the by-streets of Islington and Pentonville. Not till this moment had he felt how dear they were to him, the familiar streets. Their very odours fell sweet upon his nostrils. Never again could he go hither and thither among the old friends, the old places, to his heart's content. What had possessed him to abandon this precious liberty? The thought of Wood Green revolted him. Lived there as long as he might, he would never be at home. He thought of his wife, now waiting for him, with fear, and then, with a reaction of rage, let her wait. He, Archibald Jordan, before whom women had bowed and trembled for five and twenty years, was he to come and go at a wife's bidding? And at length the thought seemed so utterly preposterous that he sped northward as fast as possible, determined to right himself this very evening. 
Mrs. Jordan sat alone. He marched into the room with muddy boots, flung his hat and overcoat into a chair and poked the fire violently. His wife's eye was fixed on him and she first spoke in the quiet voice that he dreaded. What do you mean by carrying on like this, Archibald? I shall carry on as I like in my own ass. Hear that? I do hear it and I'm very sorry too. It gives me a very bad opinion of you. You will not do as you like in your own house. Rage as you please. You will not do as you like in your own house. There was a contemptuous anger in her eye which the man could not face. He lost all control of himself, uttered coarse oaths and stood quivering. Then the woman began to lecture him. She talked steadily acrimoniously for more than an hour regardless of his interruptions nervously exhausted he fled at length from the room a couple of hours later they met again in the nuptial chamber and again mrs jordan began to talk her point as before was that he had begun married life about as badly as possible why had he married her at all what fault had she committed to encourage such outrageous usage but thank goodness she had a will of her own and a proper self-respect. Behave as he might, she would still persevere in the path of womanly duty. If he thought to make her life unbearable, he would find his mistake. She simply should not heed him. Perhaps he would return to his senses before long, and in this vein Mrs. Jordan continued until night was at odds with morning, only becoming silent when her partner had sunk into the oblivion of uttermost fatigue. The next day Mr. Jordan's demeanour showed him, for the moment at all events, defeated. He made no attempt to read at breakfast. He moved about very quietly, and in the afternoon he came home at the regulation hour. Mrs. Jordan had friends in the neighbourhood, but she saw little of them. She was not a woman of ordinary tastes. Everything proved that, to her mind, the possession of a nice house with the prospects of a comfortable life was an end in itself. She had no desire to exhibit her well-furnished rooms or to gad about talking of her advantages. Every moment of her day was taken up in the superintendence of servants, the discharge of an infinitude of housewifely tasks. She had no assistance from her daughter, the girl went to school, and was encouraged to study with the utmost application. The husband's presence in the house seemed a mere accident, save in the still nocturnal season when Mrs. Jordan bestowed upon him her counsel and her admonitions. After the lapse of a few days, Mr. Jordan again offered combat and threw himself into it with a frenzy. Look here, he shouted at length. Either you or I are going to leave this house. I can't live with you, understand? I hate the sight of you. Go on, retorted the other with mild bitterness. Abuse me as much as you like. I can bear it. I shall continue to do my duty. And unless you have recourse to personal violence, here I remain. If you go too far, of course, the law must defend me. This was precisely what Mr. Jordan knew and dreaded. The law was on his wife's side, and by applying at a police court for protection, she could overwhelm him with shame and ridicule, which would make life intolerable. Impossible to argue with this woman. Say what he might, the fault always seemed his. His wife was simply doing her duty, in a spirit of admirable thoroughness. He, in the eyes of a third person, would appear an unreasonable and violent curmudgeon. Had it not all sprung out of his obstinacy with regard to reading at breakfast? How explain to anyone what he suffered in his nerves, in his pride, in the outraged habitudes of a lifetime? That evening he did not return to Wood Green. Afraid of questions if he showed himself in the old resorts, he spent some hours in a billiard room near King's Cross, and towards midnight took a bedroom under the same roof. On going to business next day, he awaited with tremors either a telegram or a visit from his wife, but the whole day passed, and he heard nothing. After dark, he walked once more about the beloved streets, pausing now and then to look up at the windows of this or that well-remembered house. 
Ah, if he durst but enter and engage a lodging. Impossible. Forever impossible. He slept in the same place as on the night before, and again a day passed without any sort of inquiry from Wood Green. When evening came, he went home. Mrs. Jordan behaved as though he had returned from business in the usual way. "'Is it raining?' she asked with a half-smile, and her husband replied, in as matter-of-fact a tone as he could command, "'No, it isn't.' There was no mention between them of his absence. That night Mrs. Jordan talked for an hour or two of his bad habit of stepping on the paint when he went up and down the stairs, then calmly fell asleep. But Mr. Jordan did not sleep for a long time. What? Was he, after all, to be allowed his liberty out of doors, provided he relinquished it within? Was it really the case that his wife, satisfied with her house and furniture and income, did not care a jot whether he stayed away or came home? There, indeed, gleamed a hope. When Mr. Jordan slept, he dreamed that he was back again in lodgings at Islington, tasting an extraordinary bliss. Day dissipated the vision, but still Mrs. Jordan spoke not a word of his absence, and with trembling still he hoped. End of The Prize Lodger by George Gissing End of Victorian Short Stories of Troubled Marriages